Shalom, my friends. This is Max Joseph, and I am here because it is the first day of October, which means it is time for the predictions. To give a quick rundown, the predictions will be a video that will be released on the first of every month and will feature my predictions for the upcoming Academy Awards. Each category will feature the maximum number of nominees possible with an additional few that are in the next in line. And then because it's still early in the year, you know, also global pandemic, there's no need to do the big snub that should make it. So instead I'm doing an additional few nominees that'll be titled followed by. And I won't always get into detail about every single pick because then this video would be nine hours long. So I'll always talk about my pick to win and then some other highlights on the list. And my friends, so much has happened since September 1st. We've had festivals, we've had postponements, we've had everything. The notable things are that West Side Story, Black Widow, Eternals, and The French Dispatch are now officially out of the running. But exciting thing is that Nomadland is taking this festival season by storm. I'll talk more about its success coming up, but Chloe Zhao's Nomadland is coming for these Oscars, and I'm here for it. But before I go into my predictions, please make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel, and ding that little bell to get notified whenever I post new videos. But more important than that, please make sure that you are registered to vote and cast your ballot when the time comes. And guess what? The time has come. You can register. You can vote. So do that. Register to vote at www.vote.org. Please make your voice heard. It takes less than five minutes and people's lives are literally on the line. Please, if you do anything this month, vote. And so here are my predictions for the 2021 Oscars. October edition. Best Picture. First, here are the results for your predictions for Best Picture. In the 10th slot, you voted for Ammonite. In the 9th slot, you voted News of the World. In the 8th slot, you voted for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. In the 7th slot, you voted for Hillbilly Elegy. In the 6th slot, you voted for Soul. In the 5th slot, you voted for One Night in Miami. In the 4th slot, you voted for Dune. In the 3rd slot, you voted for Nomadland. In the second slot, you voted for The Trial of the Chicago 7. And the winner, you voted for Mank. Thank you so much for voting, my friends. Keep watching because we still have two more categories to go for your predictions. All right, my friends, here we are. My top three feel pretty set. Mank is just going to stick at the top until we see anything. But because of the firepower that it has, I'm going to keep it as the winner. And now that Chicago 7 has been seen, I would imagine that Netflix will release a trailer in the very near future for David Fincher's latest film. Back to Chicago 7 for a second. It seemed to be pretty loved by most of the people who saw the film, so I feel great about keeping it in my three. Now, Nomadland, oh my goodness. Nomadland has done some incredible incredible and crazy work this month, my friends. One of its major awards occurred at the Toronto International Film Festival when it won the People's Choice Award. Now, this is some pretty good company to be in. In fact, with the exception of one. This decade, every single audience award winner at TIFF went on to either get a nomination or win Best Picture at the Oscars. Even further than that, each of those nine films ended up winning at least one Oscar. Nomadland also won the Golden Lion at Venice, which was beautiful and historic, and that was because Chloe Zhao was the first East Asian woman to win this award. Fun stat, only one film from the United States has gone on to win Best Picture after winning the Golden Lion, and that was The Shape of Water. So basically, this isn't Manx to win. Both Chicago 7 and Nomadland could easily be argued as the frontrunner. My only question with Nomadland is what would have happened if Netflix had entered these festivals? Would it have dominated as much as it has? We'll never know. Also, Regina King's One Night in Miami has joined the conversation in a major way. After receiving incredible reviews and even earning itself a nomination for the People's Choice Award at TIFF, it's up there. After these three or four nominees, it's kind of up in the air. I don't have anything breaking through the top four, but the season is really just getting started. Best Director. First, your predictions for Best Director. In the fifth slot, you voted for One Night in Miami, directed by Regina King. In the fourth slot, you voted for Dune, directed by Denis Villeneuve. In the third slot, you voted for The Trial of the Chicago 7, directed by Aaron Sorkin. In the second slot, you voted for Nomadland, 
directed by Chloe Zhao. And the winner, you voted for Mank, David Fincher. And we still have one more category, so stay tuned. I have my top four from Best Picture in this lineup, and I don't always love doing that, but I think it feels right in this case. Also, very exciting and shocking, for the first time in history, I'm predicting that two women will make this lineup. In the history of the Oscars, there has never been more than one woman nominated for Best Director in the same year. There have actually only been five nominations for women. One of those five won the award, and that was Catherine Bigelow for The Hurt Locker. Could Chloe Zhao become the second? It, it, it's possible. Just like Picture, I don't think that Fincher has too much of a leg up on Zhao. Also, you may have noticed that Zhao did go ahead of Sorkin here, and that isn't by much, but she has just a lot of momentum going for her out of these festivals, and it's, it's just really hard to not have her in there. By next month, she might even get into the top spot. And if that's the case, I might have to change picture. Regina King is also feeling really good as my number four. And then that fifth slot is where it's kind of up in the air. I'm gonna stick with Francis Lee, but I could easily change that to Paul Greengrass or Shaka King or Denis Villeneuve. Actress in a leading role. We have a new winner. I think that although Kate Winslet has everything going for her, I've done a bit of soul searching and reminded myself how brilliant Viola Davis was in Fences. Oscar, by the way. And as a reminder, Fences was originally written by August Wilson. And if she is 199th as good as she was in that, she's going to win this award in a landslide, especially given that she'll be playing off Chadwick Boseman, who I'll speak about in a few minutes. But this is such a well-written role, and she is one of the greatest actors on the planet, as well as my favorite. So I'm beginning to feel more and more on board with her taking home her second Oscar. But Kate Winslet's not off the table. I still see a pathway for her, but the competition may be too much. Also, Vanessa Kirby, welcome to the party. After winning Best Actress at Venice this year, she rose very quickly. A couple past winners of this award include Olivia Coleman for The Favorite and Emma Stone for La La Land. Both went on to win Best Actress at the Oscars. So I think that a very, very strong argument could be made for Kirby to not just be in the conversation, but to be one of the front runners. Also, as a side note, I believe Rashida Jones is going lead, so she's here now. And like I said last week, this category is stacked. Like, ridiculous. Gonna be one of my favorites of the season. Actor in a leading role. In my mind, there are three nominees on here who are getting nominated no matter what, pretty much. Those are Delroy Lindo, who was just confirmed that he'll be campaigned as lead, thank the Lord, Anthony Hopkins, and Gary Oldman. I feel almost positive about that. So that leaves two slots open. This is a weird way to count. So I believe that assuming both Daniel Kaluuya and Eddie Redmayne are campaigned as leads, they are the clear choices as of today. And based on that trailer alone for Judas and the Black Messiah, I think Kaluuya is going to be far and away the front runner. Again, assuming he's lead. If he's supporting, that changes everything. For Redmayne, I, I for sure see a world where he goes supporting. I've spoken to many, many people. And a lot of them has just said that the entire cast is supporting, but I just don't think that's what Netflix will end up going for. So let's say he does go supporting, Hanks feels like the likely replacement actress in a supporting role. First, with West Side Story going out, unfortunately, Ariana DuBose is off this list, but that means we have a front runner for next year. Second, Ronan versus Close. Nothing has changed there yet. Well, just have to wait and see the trailer for Hillbilly Elegy to get a feel of the film and what her performance may be. Third, Olivia Coleman is starting to move up a bit. She's phenomenal in The Father and is showing off some serious acting chops and has proved that she is one of the most diverse actors working today. She won Lead Actress over Close a couple years ago, and I'm not saying it's going to happen again, but I'm not not saying that. There is absolutely a scenario where it ends up being a three-way race between Ronan, Close, and Coleman, and I will lose my mind. Actor in a supporting role. I feel very weird talking about this category. Like, it actually makes me uncomfortable. Because here's the thing. Forget about acting for a second. Chadwick Boseman was one of the most incredible human beings on the planet. The fact that this man cut his own salary in order to fairly compensate what Sienna Miller deserved in 21 Bridges speaks the beyond to who Chadwick Boseman was. He battled colon cancer while filming the highest grossing film 
ever and visited sick children in hospitals. So to talk about his Oscar chant, it, I have, to talk about his Oscar chances really, really rubs me the wrong way, especially since it's still really, really fresh. So for a little bit, I'm just gonna briefly mention him and talk about the other contenders because it just doesn't sit well with me. So what I'll say about his chances is that he is a brilliant, brilliant actor who took on important and vital roles. And I believe that this one will be no different. And I expect him to deliver something extraordinary. So after him, I think that at least one person will get nominated for Chicago 7. And right now, I think that two will. And that will be Sasha Baron Cohen and Emmy winner Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. David Strathairn has been given some good reports off of Nomadland, so he also feels like a solid option. And then we have Lakeith Stanfield, who looks glorious in Judas and the Black Messiah. I'm just wondering if he'll end up going lead. I don't know. We'll find out. Original screenplay. Chicago 7 or Mank? I don't see anything else touching it. The script for Chicago 7 has already been praised, and I'd be shocked to see Mank not follow suit. But Chicago 7 feels like a film that will win one of these above the line awards. And if it's not winning picture or director, it makes sense for it to win screenplay, at least in my head, that might not for you. But what's interesting is that there aren't really contenders in that third, fourth, or fifth slot that could maybe shock. It feels very, very, very clear to me that the top two in this category are Chicago 7 and Mank. I'm also secretly hoping that Soul wins, but that stays just between us. Adapted screenplay. I mean, this just, it, Nomadland. It's the front runner, and it almost makes no sense to bet against it. I definitely think One Night in Miami is gaining some momentum, but I, I, I just don't think it'll be enough to take over Chloe Zhao's film. I think it'll be a race to see who gets nominated alongside it. I'm also really looking at Dune, because assuming it gets all the tech nominations and wins, I'm curious how it'll do in the above the line categories. We'll see, but what I will say, and I don't want to say it, I won't be surprised if we don't get Dune until next year, which would change everything. Animated feature. First, I had to get rid of Where's Anne Frank because there's no news on it. I don't see a release date, so I'm, I'm gonna get rid of it for now. Second, although Over the Moon was very well received, I doubt that it'll be enough to take over Soul. Now, my only concern is that Soul is most likely going on Disney+, Plus, and that's obviously never been done before for Pixar, and I'm not sure how that will affect its chances. It might make a difference. It may not. I, I don't know. Also, I wish they'd postpone so that it can be seen in theaters. In general, I will always prefer these movies postponed so that you can see them the way the filmmakers originally intended them to be seen. Anyway, nothing else is really popping out at me as a real contender. At this point, it's Soul or Over the Moon. And my money, always on Pixar because I'm sure you're sick of hearing it, but my favorite stat is that when a Pixar film is nominated for an original movie, AKA not a sequel, it has only lost twice. It's eight out of 10 for original films. Cinematography. Final category for your predictions. Cinematography, here are the results. In the fifth slot, you voted for Tenet. In the fourth slot, you voted for Ammonite. In the third slot, you voted for Dune. In the second slot, you voted for Nomadland. And the winner, you voted for Mank. Thank you so much for voting, my friends. Next month, we'll have even more categories, so keep an eye out on the community tab, so make sure you're subscribed so you get that notification when it's announced. Now, the reason I put this one as one of your options for your predictions is because I think that this category may not be dunes to win without question. Clearly, a majority think that Mank is the front runner, which is really a good call to you, so bravo. In fact, I see the argument for all five of these films based on reviews trailers, images, word of mouth, but for me, because of how extravagant Dune looks and how stunning that photography is, good lord, I can't not put it as my winner. So Greg Frazier, I, I'm gonna go with him, but everyone else is absolutely in the conversation and you're not wrong, you're probably right. We'll see. Production design. Nostalgia, nostalgia. It's just a thing. Sticking with Mank until Dune comes out, but even then I really don't think voters can stop the nostalgia. 
nostalgia. Voters are gonna love Oscar winner Donald Graham Burt's design and are gonna eat it up for breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, and even get up in the middle of the night and enjoy it for a midnight snack. Done. Costume design. That Dune trailer showed us a, a lot. And one of the things that really showed off was the film's unbelievable costumes by three-time nominee Jacqueline West and Bob Morgan. They are, in the true sense of the word, epic. So that's my front runner. But a film that isn't in my five, but is slowly making its way up to this lineup, is coming to America. The rumor is that the trailer will be dropping very soon, and it's scheduled for a December release. And the reason it's slowly making its way up is because two things. The first, the original Coming to America was nominated for costumes. Second, and here's the big one, the costume designer for the sequel is none other than Ruth E. Carter, who won this award for Black Panther and was nominated two more times before that. Side note, she was also the first African-American woman to win this award, so shout out to the queen. Film editing. So I was all in on Dune last month, but after learning how beautiful the editing in Chicago 7 was, it made me rethink this award because I don't think it's quite as easy to call now. When a film comes out and one of the highlights of the film is their editing, that makes a statement. When the film is an Oscar frontrunner, it really makes a statement. So although I'm still gonna go with Joe Walker, Alan Baumgarten has really entered this race. Also, another front runner is in this, and that is Nomadland. And in case you were curious, the editor is also the writer and director, Chloe Zhao. And let's say that she wins. She will make even more history by becoming the seventh woman ever to win this award. Can you imagine if she took home director, screenplay, and film editing? That would actually be one of the most major nights in the history of the arts. Forget the Oscars, in the arts. Oh my God, it would be amazing. And the fun stat, since 1934, less than 15 times is a film won Best Picture without at least a nomination in this category, so keep that in mind when you're making your predictions. Makeup and hairstyling. We have a new winner. Like I had briefly mentioned last night, someone leaked that screenshot of the Dune trailer, which I dislike, don't do that. And I said, if that was legit, I may change my pick this month, and what do you know? Dune for the win. And my friends, that trailer, it, again, I can't stop talking about it. It did it for me in every way possible. But even though I have it winning, I'm not feeling super confident because it's really a toss-up between Dune and Mank. And what I love about that is that the films couldn't be more different. You have a sci-fi fantasy film, and then you have old Hollywood. I love it. Sound. Just, just sound. Chris Nolan films do well here. They've been nominated or won this award eight times in the past, but Dune, that's my answer. I think it's just gonna dominate these tech categories. I don't know why it wouldn't at this point. Does Tenet have a chance? Yeah, but I think between the two, Dune will have the momentum and assuming it's on schedule, the better release date. If for some reason it's neither of these films, I think Chicago 7 is next in line. I also like News of the World and new to the lineup, Sound of Metal which is about a heavy metal drummer whose life is thrown into freefall when he begins to lose his hearing. Give me a, some Whiplash vibes solely because of the drumming, but you know, Whiplash won sound mixing, so it could happen. Visual effects. Two months ago, I said it's Dune versus Eternals versus Tenet. Last month, I said that it's Dune versus Eternals, and this month, I'm just gonna say that it's Dune versus everyone else. The only constant in these scenarios, Dune. And now that Eternals is delayed till next year, well, we have a front runner for next year's visual effects, and honestly, the Dune trailer surpassed, I can't stop, the Dune trailer surpassed every expectation I had for the film. And I actually can't even fathom how much more incredible the entire thing will be. So I'm just gonna say it, this is Dune's to lose. This is probably the one and only category that feels like that. Even animated has a bit of competition. But even with how incredible the visuals are in Tenet, I don't think it'll be able to stand with Dune. Calling it now, Dune will win this award in a landslide. Original score. This category, as a shocker to no one, is one of my favorites, along with animated and song, anyway. Even with all the postponements, we somehow still have Hans Zimmer for Dune, Trent Rasner and Atticus Ross for Soul, and Mank, actually. Yeah, don't let that go unnoticed. Also, John Batiste is joining Rasner and Ross for Soul. Anyway, we have Black Panther Oscar winner, Ludwig Gorenson, and last, Daniel Pemberton on The Trial of the Chicago 7. And that's just the five that I have nominated. Below that, we have Terrence Blanchard, Chris Bauer, Stephen Price. 
what? This is stacked. But because of many reasons, most important being that Dune is a passion project for Hans Zimmer, I'm gonna go with Zimmer and Dune. Original song. Again, one of my favorite categories. But this is just, th this is a wonky one this year. West Side Story is out, Annette is out, and The Heights is out. So I just, I don't see a world where Billie Eilish isn't the front runner for No Time to Die. At least until we hear something from Soul or The Prom. Rocket to the Moon is most likely gonna be the song Over the Moon campaigns for, and that feels like a pretty easy nomination. Then I'm also looking at Free from the one and only Ivan, written by Diane Warren and performed by Charlie Puth. And the reason I'm really considering it is because Diane Warren is a living legend and has been nominated 11 times and has yet to win. So like her time, which I hate saying, her time is probably coming sooner rather than later. Also, the song's gorgeous. And then right behind her, we have Taylor Swift for her song, Only the Young. I don't think it has the chance to win it all, but I absolutely believe it has a shot of getting a nomination, which would also give her her first Oscar nomination. And my friend's final announcement, next month, international, documentary. Let's go. Those are my predictions for the 93rd Academy Awards October edition. Let me know what you have predicted in the comments. Agree? Disagree? Let me know. And so my friends, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like this video. Give me your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe to this channel as well as follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at mjoseph492. Like my page on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash maxjosephfilmperson. Join the Amino live chat, which is open 24-7, 365. And if you really love me, please consider being a member of the channel where you can get member-only content, guest interviews, giveaways, and lots more. You can even give me a film to review, a 10th of the month top 10 category, a ranking, or a song to sing, and that video will be dedicated to you. Shalom, my friends.